So again, thank you. Welcome, everybody, and thank you to the organizer to allow me to, uh, to be here and to give you a short presentation about the fluorescent phenomena related to fluorescent microscopy. So please feel free to interrupt me as long as you get uh, lost or as long as, uh, as soon as uh, you feel uh, that uh, we are going into the wrong uh, direction. So why, why speaking about fluorescent microscopy? First of all, well, thinking, and we'll be a little bit from the bottom, but uh, let's say what we can do with uh, fluorescent microscopy, and later on we will see how this is achievable throughout fluorescence. First of all, we will probably determine the localization of specific protein, possibly more than one. Uh, determine the shape of what we see when we look uh, throughout a microscope in bright field, in uh, uh, regular white light imaging, we cannot really uh, understand what we are looking at. We can guess, but only throughout specific staining we will be able to, to, to determine the shape of organs, cells, intracellular structure. What we can do with uh, fluorescent microscopy is also examine the dynamics of what's happening, because we will see it can work also in live imaging. And also we can study interaction of protein and examine ion concentration. We will have several possible uh, probes, several possible fluorophore. We will see later on what is the fluorophore uh, to, uh, to understand what's going on into our cells or into our tissue. But uh, thinking about fluorescence and thinking about why, we have to understand what are the advantages of using a fluorescent microscope. First of all, it's easy to understand that we have a higher contrast using a fluorescent microscope. We are not looking to an absorption phenomena like in regular white field, in regular bright field, sorry, but we are looking to something extremely bright under a black background. This is easy to understand. It's the maximum possible contrast we can have. First of all, uh, later on, we have high specificity. As I told you, we can stain specific area of the cells, of the tissue, of the organelles, of the, of the protein. Let's say here, you can see different cytoskeletal uh, staining in red and in green, while the high specificity of the nuclear staining in this blue-violet. And this phenomena can also be quantitative. This is extremely important because the evolution of the microscopy and the uh, arrival of uh, digital microscopy allow now to understand in a quantitative manner more fluorescent, more staining. Let's say not more protein every time, but let's say more fluorescent collected means more staining, and this is a quantitative phenomenon. Uh, another evolution that allow us the fluorescent microscopy is the high resolution, even the super resolution. To achieve high resolution and super resolution, what we need is working with single wavelengths because when we work with uh, bright field, we are using the entire spectra of light. Therefore, we cannot, let's say, play with the light to understand, to increase and go over the abyss limit, the limit of optical properties that with bright field, with the white light, is not, is not passable. And finally, the fluorescent microscopy allow us to have all this kind of, so all this kind of uh, 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 advantages, high contrast, high specificity, quantitative uh, analysis, high resolution, and live cell imaging, that can be done also, as we see here, in live cell imaging. And that's the, one of the main, uh, the, the main advantages, allowing us to increase our knowledge in cell and tissue biology. Uh, a little bit of history, it's going to be just one slide. Uh, fluorescent phenomena during the history was uh, uh, was, uh, for a lot of time, was mis, uh, mismatched with phosphorescence. These are two different phenomena, even though the underlying uh, chemical and physical uh, uh, phenomena behind uh, is, is uh, similar. But uh, the fluorescence was firstly described by, in a scientific paper by, uh, by this guy, sorry, John Herschel, that, uh, well, didn't use Canada Dry, but in fact used a kinin solution a uh, quinonine, sorry, uh, okay, the quinine sulfate solution, and living on a uh, classical, every time it's up a nearby window, with this blade of light passing through, he visualized and he saw that this solution became fluorescence, became brighter than the light that was hitting the sample, and not only brighter, was heated by a regular white light from the sun, and the final effect was that the color 
outcoming was blue color. This described for the first time the phenomena as uh, specific speci superficial color presented by an homogeneous liquid internally colorless. So a completely colorless liquid was able to produce a light. Why this happen? Why, what is the principle of fluorescence? Every molecule has its own electrons. Specific molecules that are able to, uh, to produce fluorescence, therefore are called fluorophore, uh, uh, have the ability, has the ability to receive light and the electron in specific part of the molecule can jump on an excited state. Jumping on this excited state, they turn around, they start to vibrate and upon this vibration they lose heat, they lose uh, vibrational energy and they, upon their, re their release of this energy, they jump back to their basal state and they release a photon. This release of a photon is the fluorescence. This is an extremely fast phenomenon and uh, it's generally it's happened in almost all molecules are presently produce a sort of basal minimum fluorescent. The, what we generally use are real fluorophores, so molecules with high quantum efficiency that are able to jump on the excited state and release photon with an high efficiency. Uh, even though every molecule can be uh, theoretically excited to this, uh, to this level. To describe this phenomena, Jablowski uh, show us this, uh, uh, the energy diagram. Uh, this scientist, uh, and this don't be scared, is a little bit uh, complex, but we will go through quite, uh, in a quite uh, fast manner. So here you see on the bottom part, the ground state, the possible level that single electron uh, in the molecule uh, present in basal state, not excited. Upon the arrival of a light, these electrons are able to jump on the excited state. Here they are, and this phenomenon is extremely fast. We are speaking about femtosecond. So we are, it's really an extremely fast phenomenon. Here the, the electron start to vibrate and they perform the so-called internal conversion. That means they lose a part of the energy going down to a secondary excited state that is less energetic than the first one. And in, from that state, they release photon releasing fluorescence. So this phenomenon is extremely fast. This phenomenon is slightly slower. We are still in the femtosecond, sorry, in the picosecond scale while the fluorescent is in nanosecond scale. I'm just giving you this kind of information simply because some specific microscopy technique in fluorescence, like FLIM, fluorescence lifetime microscopy, really are developed to take advantage of all different possible state of the fluorescent uh, molecule. Uh, sometimes measuring this uh, speed of uh, uh, fluorescence production, sometimes uh, the measuring the delay of the fluorescence production, that's changed in every possible molecule and also in the different condition. This phenomena, this direct phenomena is the fluorescence, extremely fast. The delayed fluorescence can produce at the end the so-called phosphorescence. That can last for seconds, for minutes. Think about the, your, uh, uh, the, your watches that during the night are able to uh, produce phosphorescence for a long, for a long time. So, just uh, dividing the two phenomena, as I said to you, for, uh, fluorescence and phosphorescence are both uh, type of the so-called uh, biological luminescence. And in fluorescence, the emission is extremely fast, while in phosphorescence, that can continue for uh, quite a long time. Again, in terms of the difference between the two of them, the fact that uh, this, uh, the luminescence can continue after radiation uh, sometimes can cause problem into your sample because you don't know that maybe you have some phosphorescent element into your sample. So you have to uh, consider to, be, to work without the presence of phosphorescence in, in um, uh, fluorescent microscopy. So going back to, to, the, uh, to our uh, drawing, let's think about the light exciting the cells at different levels in different 
uh, in different layer of the cells and the emission that is no more a subtractive phenomenon. We are not looking like in Brightfield to the light that is, let's say, heated by the sample, that is blocked by the sample. Here, what we are measuring is the light at the end produced by the sample. And the light coming out is going in all directions. So the phenomenon is quite, let's say, inefficient. Because even though we focus the light on a single point, following a single uh, path with a specific beam, at the end, what happens is that the fluorophore light up as a lamp, producing light in all directions, but your optics are just in one direction. So your optics will collect just a tiny fraction of the fluorescence produced. And that's why fluorescent microscopes are so expensive, are so <laughs> big, uh, needs to be extremely sensitive, uh, because the amount of light that at the end of all these phenomena is produced is extremely limited. But uh, what's happened to the single molecule that, are, uh, that, are, that receive the light? They receive the light in a specific wavelength or in a specific range of wavelength, and this is called absorption uh, phenomena. So every molecule is able to collect energy in that wavelength so you need to use a range of light, or a specific, if you want to achieve directly the so-called 100% of excited state. And the molecule that is therefore excited, or the electron, that, to be precise, that are excited, are able to release a photon with, the, uh, with a different spectra, with a different color. So we are using a wavelength, highly energetic in the left part of the spectra, and we receive photons that are lower energetic, so with a less energy uh, release. This difference from the name of the scientist that, uh, that described the two spectra uh, for the first time is called Stoke shift, and this is a specific feature of every single 404 you're going to use. And this is also a, a specific parameter that you have to consider using specific type of uh, uh, fluorescent microscope. If you are using a FRET technique uh, with a resonance transfer of the fluorescence, if you are using specific filter, you need to know the distance between the two peaks and to know that uh, the ability of the molecule to, uh, to produce uh, the emission spectra. So the, generally the two peaks are often called as a mirroring, so the, generally the emission peak is similar to the absorption peak, even though we have uh, uh, often possible different states that are produced in the uh, absorption part of the, of the peak. Again, the, that's why the, the mirror image rule is generally considered as a sort of golden rule, so that's allow you a little bit to understand where your fluorophore are going to uh, emit fluorescence and which kind of setup you need to use. And in that uh, in that level, you know that every vibrational state that is reached in the high energy part is going to release in the, uh, in the low energy part with the different uh, vibrational state upon the... What's happened here between the left, the absorption part, and the emission part is the internal conversion state, the part that I show you at the beginning, the Yablowski diagram. The electron excited here start vibrating, losing energy as heat, as vibrational state, as movement, even though. And upon the release of the photon, evidently the photon will be less energetic. So we'll have a longer wavelength. Going on, it's important to remember that a component, what's your component of interest, is what is specifically leveled. Just consider that often you also have autofluorescence. You will heard about uh, by uh, Michaela in the, in the next uh, talk. Uh, every time you try to see something in fluorescence, you, will be, uh, you need to understand that you will be often overloaded by different signals that are not specific at all, that are not what are you looking at. So it's important that uh, to know what is your fluorophore, what is the molecule you're looking at, to have your setup specific to really visualize only what are you aiming at. Thinking about fluorescence, and we think about specific uh, high-level molecule, we need to remember that fluorescence, as we saw with uh, uh, kinin before, is a natural phenomenon. Happened in, uh, in nature, 
uh, often. And if we take here, we have example of uh, animals, uh, flowers, all of them, regular upon illumination, they produce possible fluorescence. What's happened generally is that the stoke shift, so between the excitation uh, spectra and the emission spectra in natural molecule is generally quite large. It's generally, there is a, generally a huge distance between the, uh, the absorption spectra and the emission spectra. And this is generally not what we want on a microscope because when we have this kind of large stoke, we almost use the entire spectra, the entire visible spectra. So we are going to be able, if we use this kind of the molecule, let's say, present in, uh, in, this, uh, in this area, we will only be able to use one color in our microscopy, while we want to achieve as much as possible uh, colocalization, uh, presence of multiple staining, and therefore molecules that are optimized, again from nature, but optimized to have a small stoke shift are generally more useful in fluorescent microscope because you can use different parts of the spectra and let's say use molecule producing fluorescence in that area and having the blue light as we saw in the first image and then having a molecule in that part of the spectra producing light and so having a green a fluorescent protein or a green light produce and then having molecule in that part as red uh, fluorescent or even far red fluorescence. That's why we want multiple wavelength fluorescent imaging. It's gorgeous to be to have high contrast. It's great to be high resolution. It's great to be uh, high contrast. Sorry, high contrast, high resolution, high, uh, high specificity. But what is important for you is to have several different signal on the single uh, on the single cells you're looking at. Because in one case, being able to to see for example, uh, just uh, element present in the nuclei of the cells or element present both in the nuclei and in the external part of the cells alone that they don't give you any kind of real information unless you see something else to, uh, to normalize your signal, something else to, uh, to know if you're looking into the cells or out of the cells. Think about some specific spot, for instance, this molecule, if collected with a high resolution microscope or a super resolution microscope would be you will find perfectly bright spot on a black on a completely black background you will not even experience the ability to see the nuclei the shape of the nuclei that here is provided by this uh, uh, let's say out of focus fluorescence therefore in high resolution and in high specificity fluorescent microscopy you need to have more color to even just to know what where you are looking at if you are looking into the cells into the nuclei on the membrane so you need every time multiple staining and this is achievable simply because molecule like gfp yfp these are all fluorescent protein that are the one that were behind the the nobel prize for the gfp that was the first uh, fluorescent protein uh, detected in jellyfish and you see their uh, their stoke shift is so small that you can have a single image with image with a different channel produced with element in the uh, blue light uh, azure light green yellow red and right now even far red light so you will have up to five six seven different uh, color if you need to. You need to, this color, this is a matter of your biological question and also it's a matter of your uh, physical setup. Few microscopes are able to produce such amount of different lines. Generally, uh, microscopes used in the regular uh, research are able to produce three to four channels. You generally don't need much more than this for a regular imaging, even though uh, for uh, other topic you will need uh, the so-called spectral microscope able to collect images from every single element. But we have physical real limitation in the term of setup, in the term of the microscope. And that's, so even though we can able, we are able with the fluorescent microscopy to visualize element in the, in the cytoskeletal, in the membrane, to visualize the DNA, we can visualize single protein with specific antibody, 
we have a fluorescent indicator of the environment, indicator of the pH, indicator of the uh, so molecule able to become fluorescent or to change their color in presence of specific ion, in presence of a specific uh, membrane potential. Uh, we have uh, the so-called proximity indicator, so molecules that are able to become fluorescent just when they are coupled. So you have a plethora of different techniques that can be uh, developed, that can be used, that, can, that have been developed. What you need to remember is that you need specific setup generally. That does not exist, let's say, the single perfect uh, machine. That's a classical problem from the point of view of uh, PI that want to buy the, uh, or dream to have, uh, let's say, the, the total microscope. That's never, that will never happen. It's like trying to run uh, the uh, Parida car with a Ferrari or try to run uh, a Grand Prix with a Jeep. You need specific setup and that's why you will experience three different uh, setup uh, and a fourth with this one. Uh, just to uh, just understand that each one of that will give you a different uh, feedback, different imaging, different performance, even different color for some uh, in some case, a different speed of acquisition, and so on. Knowing that and knowing which are the machine you are uh, you will uh, have to use and you will use, you, I just want you to remember that every single fluorophore is uh, presenting this parameter. In 90% of the case, working with regular commercial fluorophore, you generally don't need to go really through uh, all these parameters. Sometimes it's useful at the end when something goes wrong or you see really a low fluorescence, maybe some collaborator of you will give you a, a red fluorescent protein and you expect to see perfectly well under your microscope with a setup for the red fluorescence and you go there and you see nothing, or you see really a low amount of fluorescence. And then you, st you start even wasting time trying to understand what's, what, uh, what was wrong, maybe it was the wrong uh, uh, cells, maybe it was the wrong uh, condition. In fact, what's happened is that maybe simply the fluorophore they gave you has a really low quantum efficiency. And you need to know, you need to increase the timing of your camera, you need to uh, use a different microscope that is able to collect really low signal. So you need to know what are the efficiency of your fluorophore. To know how bright is, you need to know how stable is. You will meet in the, in the next lecture uh, the detail about the fact that if a fluorophore you are using is a bad fluorophore, your Im you will just have really few seconds to take an image because the image will get uh, burned in, uh, in a really few seconds. And this is given by the photostability of the elements. So let's say that uh, generally the new fluorophore produced by a company, let's say Dylight, Alexa, these are just few commercial names of fluorophore that you can use as probe indicator in fluorescent microscopy, are generally, let's say, quite stable from one side. From the other side, company uh, likes to increase the power of the, of the laser, of the lamp that are used. So something that, was, that would be extremely stable on a new, uh, on an old microscope with a regular lamp now tends to be less stable simply because we are illuminating them with such a powerful laser that we tends to destroy its own fluorescence. Just uh, a final reminder about the fluorescence emission spectra, uh, this, is important to, uh, this is important for me, uh, you to remember that even upon a complex or a, a, a complex excitation spectra, you can excite the molecule at several different wavelengths. It's quite broad, the emission, the, sorry, the excitation spectra. You can use, uh, let's say, UV light, extremely powerful, or blue light. The emission spectra will be every time the same. Okay, you will have every time the peak, so the maximum ability of a molecule to release a photon, so a light, a photon of light, will be every time with that color as a maximum. It's not, when you use a higher energy state, you are not producing fluorescence specifically here simply because you are uh, farther away from the, uh, from the uh, emission, uh, the, the excitation and the emission uh, stoke shift. Simply, you see that here, the ability of produced 
the jumping state of the, of the electron is simply less efficient, even though you are using a higher energy light, is less efficient than using the perfectly matching excitation spectra with the emission spectra, so the, the short stoke sheet. Again, if you are using a laser line or a lamp producing light in that area, you will simply produce the same color at the end, simply with less effect, with less quantum efficiency, with less uh, effect in the end in the light you collect. Upon these characteristics of the fluorescence, I just le leave you and you find also in the, in the, in the main uh, characteristic that we get through. So the excitation that is extremely fast, the emission that is fast but not so fast and you will experience a little bit the timing using the confocal microscope and playing with uh, uh, the so-called pixel dual or with the time of uh, the machine remaining of the single, of the single uh, uh, pixel because uh, the machine generally tends to stay in microseconds, seems seem a really short time, but in fact uh, is, uh, let's say, just sufficient to collect enough light in this context because this is a nanosecond phenomenon, so it's about 100, uh, 1000 times faster, but it's not a completely different uh, timing scale. Finally, just as a reminder, Remember, transmittance, so a regular small microscope uh, in bright field is a subtractive phenomena. You have some things blocking the light, and which is your, uh, which is your uh, sample, while in fluorescence is the light that is collected and is produced by your sample. So the amount of light is much less. And to produce this light, we need a specific setup. So I will to achieve this light, we need a specific setup. Again, conventional microscope, you probably all know, simply use light to illuminate the sample and the light that is either scattered, either uh, uh, diffracted, or either absorbed, different type of bright field, are visualized on a conventional microscope. In fluorescent microscope, you need an incredibly higher energy of light because you need the light produced by your sample. Your sample will never be like a lamp, will be just few tiny and small uh, photons that you can even count how few they are, <coughs> I'm sorry. And so the light excites fluorescence and the sample is emitted by your, by your the, the light is emitted by your sample. To to achieve these final results, so to have high resolution, high contrast, high specificity in your sample to collect the light, you need, uh, now you perfectly understand, a specific setup. So what are the elements that makes different a regular microscope from a fluorescent microscope? First of all, you need a specific light source. The general bright white lamp is not sufficient to have enough uh, powerful light to achieve the fluorescence in your tiny sample. And then you need a second essential element that is called the filter cube. Can have different shape, we will see the regular one, the classical one, but the, this needs to be present in all fluorescent microscopes, from confocal, super resolution, epifluor, classical epifluorescent microscope, all fluorescent microscopes need to have this kind of technology, somehow disassembled and made in a different manner, but it's called every time as filter cube. So, regular classical microscope, fluorescent microscope, in bright field the light passes through the sample from the bottom. This is an upright microscope, please just consider in case of an inverted microscope, like you probably will see in the confocal, it's, they are generally inverted microscopes because they work also for live cell imaging. But when you are speaking about fluorescence, you have the source, the light source, that needs to reach the sample throughout the objective, the sample produces the light and is collected throughout the eyepiece, your camera, your sensors, and so on. So we have here one specific element, the filter cube. The lamp and the filter cube are the two elements that makes this microscope a fluorescent microscope. In terms of lamp, now we have several different choice and possibility. The most historically used was the mercury arc lamp producing specific high peak of light, even though we generally use even the low 
part of the emission spectra. These are emission spectra from the lamp. If we think about that lamp you have on, uh, on your left, this is a white lamp, right, yellowish lamp. This lamp would have probably a spectra design like this with a broad peak nearby the yellow, but producing nevertheless the entire spectra because it's mainly white, so we have the entire uh, spectra of light. Now we have mercury lamp, xenon lamp, metalite lamp producing several high peak of uh, emission and more recently we start having also LID lamps that have the ability to produce really the single wavelength we are really interested in. Even using single wavelength interested, we are interested in, we still use the so-called filter cube that I'm gonna show you right now. Because what we need to do upon the production of the light, you see throughout the spectra, this lamp, they generally produce every time several different light. So for your fluorophore, for your molecule, we need to be more specific as possible to achieve the excitation using the best wavelength, the best light, the best color of light. To do this, the filter cube is done with an excitation filter at the beginning that simply select one of the wavelength or a narrow band of the light produced. In that case, the example is blocking the red part, the green part of the light, the yellow part of the light, and just leaving the blue part of the light passing through. In the filter cube, we have the so-called wrongly dichroic mirror. In fact, the real name should be dichromatic mirror, but I don't know why for historical reason it was called as dichroic. Dichromatic because this particular mirror and filter as a, as a particular feature is a mirror for the blue light in that case but is a filter leaving the other light passing through. So it's like the blue light reach this mirror, 45 degrees placed in the cube, is projected through the sample throughout the optics. The sample produce a huge, we saw that it's not huge, but a huge scattering of light, produce green light, and a part of this green light is collected again by the optics and is able to bypass the mirror, because the mirror for the green light is not a mirror, sorry, it's a filter, it's just a window open. Again, we have another filter right here that is called the emission filter that simply block all other light coming through. You have to think your sample are generally on glass and your glass will produce reflection in any case. So a part of this blue light in any case will be able to be reflected back, even if it's a small part of the light, uh, you have to consider that the light, the green light produced in fluorescence is about, let's say, less than 1% of the light you are using will go, is going to be um, brought back by your sample. Your sample will, as a, with high quantum efficiency, the highest possible quantum efficiency is lower than 1% of the light given. Okay, so you give 100 photons of blue light and the fluorescent molecule will give you back one photon of green light. And this is with high efficient fluorescence. In generally, the phenomena is uh, another order of magnitude less efficient. So you have to consider that in that, in that context, even just 1% of reflected light will be as bright as your sample. So you have 1% of green and 1% of the blue coming back. So even with this mirror for the blue, it a small part of the blue light would be probably able to, to pass by, so you need an emission filter blocking all the other blue light, eventual red light, eventual other light that is getting throughout. So you need to be more precise as possible, and this emission filter will block the light. All, uh, all filter cubes present this kind of characteristics to, be, to describe. So, the first excitation filter is open, so this is the, uh, the transparency spectra of this filter, so it's open to the blue light. Then we have the dichroic mirror that you see is reflecting, so it's not open, it's reflecting the blue light, so no light is able to pass through, but at the specific wavelength, get open to all the other light passing through, so the green, the red light passing here is able to to pass the filter. 
And then you have the emission filter here that is open again just for the light you are interested in. So why just for the light you are interested in? We saw before the spectra, when you perform a green with the spectra of the green fluorescent protein, you see that the green fluorescent protein is not only green. It's green, it's yellow, it's even a little bit red. It has a huge, it has a huge, as an all natural molecule, it has a huge spectra. Even though, as I told you, you want to achieve multiple color microscopy. So you cannot have your green fluorescent protein being green, yellow, orange, red. You just want to see the green fluorescent protein as simply as green. And so that's why you have also the emission filter allowing you to collect just the green part of that <laughs> spectrum. Again, another drawing of the same concept, the light reaching the sample, from the light produced from the sample, bypassing the, uh, the, the mirror, and reaching the eyepiece or the camera. And this is the real physical shape of, the, of a filter cube. With the excitation, right down here a hole for the light being projected, and here is reported as dichromatic, as I told you before, and the light coming back, which is not retained by the emission barrier, is the one that you will collect in fluorescent microscopy. When you buy or when you have a fluorescent a filter cube, what you need to have in your notebook, I think, is this kind of spectra. This is the description, is the a sum of the three small spectra I showed you before, just showing that the dichroic mirror is open for here for the blue for the uh, blue light. So sorry, the uh, emission light it's the, from the source. We have the green light in that case. The green light in that case is able to pass in that part because it's open. The excitation filter is here is in red, so the light can pass here, but is blocked by the mirror, so cannot bypass the mirror, but only the light produced here is able to bypass in the emission filter. Okay, one limitation. Now we know that with fluorescent microscope we can see a fluorescent molecule. The limitation, as I told you, is the fact that you need one filter cube for each fluorophore you want to see. Now, there are family of similar fluorophores, so you, sometimes, you generally don't need a different filter cube for, let's say, for these three, uh, three wavelengths or for these three color, GFP, Fitch, Alexa Fluor for 88. These are three green uh, producing molecule or a protein in the case of Fitch. Even though they have slightly different spectra, you can use the same cube. But in any case, if you want to have blue fluorescence, green fluorescence, red fluorescence, far red fluorescence, or like the cyanine fluorescence, you need to have specific filter cube. Generally, an optimal research microscope is generally suited with a four filter cube, allowing you to have this kind of four color. So blue, green, red, and far red. Far red is still a little bit less used, simply because in the case of the far red, uh, you, only, you really have to trust in your camera because you will never see. Unless any one of you and is a superhero, we don't see in, in uh, we don't see the heat, we don't see the far red spectra. It's called far red simply to better understand where it is in the spectra, but it's already a heat production, a photon of uh, of a wavelength that is generally considered as already a, a sort is in, in the heat spectra, and is a is a is a light that is almost invisible for human eyes, not for animals, but for human, not for other animals, but for human eyes are invisible. Nevertheless, our cameras, scientific cameras, are able to collect this heat as light. And so we also can collect a fourth channel using the entire spectra and keeping them separated for that reason. So my almost final take home message, because I just want you to remember that Please remind, the longer the wavelength and the lower is the energy you collect. So don't be often, uh, it's often a mismatch thinking about longer wavelength is a uh, higher energy. No, longer wavelength means, if you want, longer wa wavelength means lower frequency of the frequency, sorry, on the, of, the, of the wavelength. That means lower energy. And that's why we can achieve stimulation of a molecule, excitation of a molecule, and produce 
fluorescence because we lose a part of the energy. As I told you, it's not an efficient phenomenon, but uh, we are able, nevertheless, to have a specific signal in this way. So the shorter the wavelength and the higher the energy, and that has some implication, especially thinking about photobleaching, about stability of the molecule, about also stability of your own sample that can be affected by the use of UV light instead of, uh, uh, or high energy uh, wavelength. One uh, important concept for me to you about fluorescence is about the intensity. As I show you, uh, showing the effect that, that using a high energy uh, light, uh, you will not achieve a different color in the, if the fluorophore is green, it's going to remain green. This is important because what you are collecting is the intensity of a signal at the end of all. And this intensity of the signal is in fact just related to the probability of what's happening. So the phenomena of photon of light hitting your molecule and producing fluorescence is a stochastic phenomenon. Not all the photons we are using are able to hit the electrons in the molecule in the right timing, in the right condition to produce fluorescence. So uh, when fluorescence happens in that molecule is an all or nothing phenomenon. So if you see a fluorophore, the fluorophore is on. If you, it's not that if you increase the laser power, you will make this fluorophore more bright, brighter. Okay, this fluorophore you are looking at at the beginning is going to remain absolutely the same. When you increase the power of the lamp, when you increase the power of the laser, you have two phenomena. You increase the probability to excite other fluorophore, maybe a nearby fluorophore that before was not, was not uh, uh, excited. And so you have the impression to have a brighter, you have a brighter image, but simply because you are switching on more fluorophore. You're not making your single fluorophore more bright. And that's, but you also have a, a shortcut, a short uh, coming from this. If you increase the intensity of the light, you start destroying the fluorophore. So from one side, you increase the probability to excite more fluorophore. From the other side, you increase the probability to destroy them. Again, Remember what is the wavelength in terms of energy of light that is absorbed and light that is emitted. And just a few slides to show you at the, at the end what we can achieve and what you will achieve with the uh, staging here. You can have direct coupling of single molecule or micromolecule. You have fluorescence dye and fluorescent substrate. Cells can even overexpress or express their own fluorescent protein. You have, for that reason, fluorescent fusion protein, allowing you to follow the single protein produced by the cells in different areas of the cells, their timing, their degradation, even their passage throughout the lysosome, the changing of the pH of the area where they are. You can really perform different, several different analyses on this. And you can, again, going back to the initial kind of imaging, you can specifically visualize, like here, uh, mitochondria and uh, uh, scaffold, or, or sorry, Golgi vesicle in that case, or the scaffold of actin and the nuclei. And you want to achieve this kind of, at the end, of up to four color images. As I told you, the far red is a, is a color we are not able to detect with our eyes, so in general, microscopies has their own conventional color. So even though it's not that wavelength, they use pink or violet color to add the fourth color to blue, red, and green to achieve higher contrast in the image they are showing you. Like in that case, where the scaffold of these cells are colored in pink. The color you are collecting, in fact, are generally simply counted as photon. They, the color you gave them is a conventional way. Nevertheless, please don't use a red color to when you are describing a GFP fusion protein, because sometimes happens this in paper. And generally, reviewers are not really happy that you are describing a GFP protein and you are showing a red images. But it's just a matter that generally microscopes collect images in as photons, so as, let's say, uh, black and white, and then you color the image at the end. Other, the fact that, uh, as I told you, the specificity of the signaling allow you to understand 
what are you looking at and their different localization, like here in tissue or plants. And what you can also have is uh, generally is also couple your fluorescence imaging with uh, uh, bright field imaging. Simply because, as I told you, sometimes the fluorescent imaging is so perfectly uh, contrasted that you see the, your molecule so bright under a black background. So if you have this kind of staining, or even this kind of staining, you, you have, I have to admit, I have trouble to understand what, I, what I'm looking at. If, I'm, if I was not the guy taking, or, or the lady taking the, the image, uh, the image is here, and uh, you show me this kind of image, I would be really in, uh, in, uh, in trouble to understand that these are cells, or these are uh, uh, vesicle into the cells. Okay, maybe these are nuclei, can be, but simply because I know we are speaking about cellular biology in that case. In that condition, a regular bright field technique like DIC or Nomarski technique, producing this kind of contrasted imaging in bright field, allow us to at least to understand in total what we are looking at. Again, images of single spot, you see this single spot, without the counter staining would be impossible to understand, impossible to allowing us to say, okay, these are a single receptor on the membrane or these are a single uh, ribosomes present into the cells, we need to have a counter staining. That's why we need to have more, uh, more light, more uh, possible source of light, and definitely more filter cube to have different color. Finally, this is the main idea of what you just need to have as in terms of the Yablowski. I show you an extremely complex Yablowski diagram. I just, just want you to remember that you can even use different source of light or different wavelength. At the end, you will have your emission all related to the same status, status and with the same level of uh, light, the color of light at the end. Remember the fact that the stoke shift is important to detect how your filter cube and how your machine is working on, simply because with filter cube, highly high-end filter cube, sometimes you cannot use uh, this, uh, two similar fluorophore. You have maybe a red fluorescent protein and you have uh, rhodamine. They all look red on a regular old microscope and then you have a beautiful new filter cube and this filter cube given the stoke shift, will block the rhodamine in the middle and you will just see one of the fluorophores. So consider when you go for the first time on a fluorescent microscope uh, here in your home lab to have a look of how your filter cube are designed, what are their emission and emission spectra, like right mirror and excitation spectra, because this will allow you to understand that maybe you were buying, I don't know, Alexa fluor antibody 560 and the filter cube you were using was a 590 nanometer uh, band and so probably you were already collecting half of the possible light you were achieving. So knowing how the filter cube are done allow you to buy or to use the correct fluorescent protein, the correct fluorescent dye and to understand uh, what you need to, to have. These uh, as reported are the parameters that you have for the different color. Again, you have to design a fluorescent protein. You want to decide, but please don't decide only based on the color, simply because one color is fancier than another one. Consider that your protein is really low produced by the cells or really difficult to visualize even with uh, external antibody. Please use a, uh, a fluorescent protein like, for instance, an Ansett GFP that has an incredibly higher quantum yield and quantum efficiency comparing to red fluorescent protein. You need a red fluorescent uh, instead of using red FP, which was the old version of red uh, fluorescent protein. Go to M cherry, go to tomato. There are several possible names, and you can find all this kind of information in uh, these links. Several of these books are freely. Uh, downloadable or uh, can be released by the, uh, by the PI that produced the book. And please, being in the University of Trieste, I have free access of uh, some of these uh, book in ebook version. So feel free to write me to this email so I will share with you 
information and uh, for possible questions that maybe we will not get through right now. Okay, thank you and I am open for your questions.